Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. Welcome to election year 1996, which we will celebrate with a contest that will be announced at the end of this program. Election year, once again, American democracy is under harsh scrutiny. Many voters are fed up with the tone, the cost, the length, and the unfairness of our elections. But is all the criticism warranted? Joining us for our discussion are Michael Barone, senior writer at U.S. News & World Report and co-author of The Almanac of American Politics and Our Country, The Shaping of America from Roosevelt to Reagan. Ronald Walters, chairman of the political science department at Howard University and author of Black Presidential Politics in America, A Strategic Approach. And Stephen Hess, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and author of the forthcoming book, Presidents and the Presidency. The topic before this house, Rights and Wrongs of American Elections, this week on Think Tank. In this presidential election year, the quadrennial hand-wringing has already begun. For example, critics complain about the lack of civility in American elections, but that's really nothing new. In 1800, Thomas Jefferson's candidacy caused the Connecticut Current to warn that, quotes, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced if Jefferson were to be elected. Pundits also warned that voter turnout is low. In 1992, only 55% of eligible voters cast ballots in the presidential election. But that is actually about the average turnout for the last 70 years. And it was the highest turnout since 1972. And our election system sometimes yields presidents who are elected by a minority of the voters. For example, Bill Clinton received just 43% of the popular vote. But so what? One American president won his first term with just 39% of the popular vote. That was Abraham Lincoln. How do American elections today compare with what we have had previously in this country? Gee, it was only 70 years ago that women didn't vote. And it was only 130 years ago that blacks were unable to vote. Well, even more recently, 30 years ago, that the Voting Rights Act went into effect and effectively enfranchised some four right. or five percent of Americans who were Southern blacks who weren't allowed to vote under either the legal system or sanctions of violence in the South. So that's, we've had these, our Constitution and, and more, has been sort of happily elastic in and, including and people at the original framers More, didn't more recently to. than that, we now have an 18-year-old vote. Which we yeah. didn't have. So you watch the franchise expand from the original concept of white male property owners. At a time when most people were property owners, yeah. white, most white males yeah. were, but nonetheless, yeah. yes. Yeah. You, so you, would you, we all agree expanding. that it is a more inclusive system? Is there anybody who would Absolutely. doubt it? Absolutely. It's yeah. more inclusive. Many people do not choose to be included. I mean, one no, of the I, ironies I is that uh, our, voter, our, our turnout is somewhat lower, not hugely lower, as Ben points out, than it was in the 1960s, even though it's easier to vote. The Southern blacks who were excluded from voting by violence now can vote since the Voting Rights Act. We make it easier for people to register and vote, and yet 45% uh, of our fellow citizens choose not to do something which is no harder than getting a driver's license, which yeah. most people manage to do. But you know, Mike, the, the two distinguished political scientists had a, a rationale for that horizontal line. You saw you could draw a horizontal line right. in the turnout. Yeah. Um, it was that a lot of Americans, even going back to the last century, simply have not been interested in politics. Uh, we have a very individualistic ethos in this country. Not everybody's interested in politics. And I would extend it one other uh, thing further, and that is that to the extent that we are a country of immigrants and people from other places, uh, we are not a homogeneous group, that political participation in this country uh, is not a, as organic a proposition as it is, uh, for example, in the countries of Europe. I, I, is that, uh, Ron, is that good or bad? I think to some extent it's, uh, it's bad. Uh, and one of the reasons for that, of course, is that you have had then these tremendous movements uh, in the black community among women to actually expand uh, political participation. So that elections, of course, are, are a narrow issue here. The wider question is democracy itself in the 20th century and the extent to which elections help to further that. Let, yeah. let, let, me, let, me, let me just butt in with, with one more thing. Our uh, turnout rates 
are low, but we do hold more sorts of elections, as I understand it, than any other country. We elect the sewer board and the school board and the dog catcher. We have catcher. something like, 50, what is it, 55,000 yeah. elected officials yeah. in this country or something. Yeah, you I, could I fill a heard, stadium with them. I, yeah. I have had numbers larger than, heard numbers larger than that. It's 325,000. 325,000. 325,000 yeah. elected That's more than official. a stadium. There's no stadium big enough yeah, for all those big enough for that. That's three Rose Bowls. That's, that's, right. Right. that's right. You, you don't so, so that is a pretty participatory. Yeah, that's yeah, true. But you don't want a politically overheated system necessarily. Uh, and it is certainly true, as Ron says, that we're as apolitical a country as you can get. I mean, you ask the people what's on their mind, and they'll tell you their families and their religion and their and their their uh, uh, job and their leisure, and it'll take more than ten fingers to get to a really political question. But on the other hand, the most simple act of citizenship, the simplest thing that you ask people for, the the, the modest glue that holds it together, is simply going and voting. Uh, and I still find it very difficult to explain and ha very ha unsatisfactory to know that 45% right. of our, of our uh, eligible voters don't vote. All right, let, let, me ask, let me go on to another idea. It is said that uh, money is poisoning this system and elections are corrupt. Are elections more or less corrupt than they used to be? They're very much less corrupt. I mean, you used to have the, you know, the guy going in there and giving five bucks to people to vote and things like that. I mean, uh, we're, we're very much less corrupt. I would, what is, almost, what is, what is I would the, almost assert the opposite premise, Ben, that one of the things our elections were suffering from to some extent is not enough money, at least not enough money, because you can't communicate in a country of 260 million people without spending some money. You can't just, you know, no presidential candidate can go door to door, no U.S. Senate candidate in a state with 2 million or 20 million people can contact everybody. Some money is needed to be expended in some ways. Our system doesn't expend a vast amount of money on political campaigns when you compare it to what we spend quite legitimately on advertising soap and other household products. Yeah, but uh, the, the money ahead. doesn't have to come from the places it comes now. I mean, there, there uh, were surely it, it better costs, ways to do campaign costs, finance than we have. Exactly. Yeah, it but costs what, something Stephen, to run but elections, my, but it doesn't have yeah, to be but the Steve, way we finance Stephen, it this morning. My, my question right. was specifically compared to when. I mean, tell us what the word bagman means. Well, cash Somebody. was a major element yeah. as recently as 1972, the April 7th, 72, the last day of the old campaign finance thing. $3 million cash came into the committee to reelect the president, President Nixon, over the transom. They couldn't count it all. Bagman you know, was a word, a guy came in with a sack full of money. That's right. But you know, you can get it down to the lower level here. You used to have something called walking around money in campaigns. Right. Does it exist done, now? <laughs> it exists. And the point I'm making is that you've simply institutionalized the corruption. Uh, it's still there, but now you have, to, you have to tell the Federal Election Commission what you did with the walking around money. So it's, it's still there, and, but it, a lot of it, of course, through the mechanisms we have have been institutionalized. Well, you know, the, the, Suzanne Garment, who was a colleague of mine at the American yes. Enterprise Institute, wrote this book called Scandal, and yeah. she says that the reason we have so much more scandal in our media now is because we have institutionalized it by having these uh, public reports through the Federal Election Commission, you know, where did you get your money? And you have to account and you say, oh, you got it from the Dirty Air Pack, or you know, uh, you got it That's for the uh, Be Kind to Criminals Pack, a and then you, can, you don't have to do much reporting. You can just go out and say, look at what this- Surely you're not saying, Ben, that you'd rather not know. No, no, I would rather know. I, I'm saying, as, as fact, Michael, ben, we is that a, the system is much we clearer have a now. Big, we've, yeah. we've developed since the 1970s a big loophole in our presidential campaign financing thing called the soft money right. loophole. Yeah. Right. It's technically for local party activities, which sounds very good and sometimes is, but what it's amounted to is that we can now have the $300,000, $500,000 contribution by one individual can actually be brought to play for the political parties now in a way that it couldn't when they first wrote the law. The loophole is eating up the law, and what do you call a man who contributes three hundred thousand dollars to at this point the Democratic Party? And the answer it used to be Republican is Mr. Ambassador. Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let, let me move on to one other item. Our uh, election system and our politics has turned malign and nasty. And you hear it from all the folks on the Hill. You know, it's not fun anymore. I don't know where it says in the Constitution that it's supposed to be fun. But anyway, uh, that, that that everybody's so nasty. But isn't it true that in our history? Um, elections have been much, much nastier than they are now. I, I've got a quote here about Lincoln 
Ben, He's we had a civil war after Lincoln. A rail splitting buffoon from the backwoods growing up in uncouth ignorance, and you've all heard those kind of... Uh, is, it, uh, is it better or worse today than it used well, to be? <clears throat> We can, we can choose an example of a past election to prove anything we, we, we want. Uh, I came into this as a, as a young voter uh, when the candidates were Dwight Eisenhower and Adlai Stevenson. Uh, and I, I long for that degree of civility again. It's, it's worse. Um, and one of the reasons it's worse, not because I think uh, it's nastier now than it was before, but uh, the press is a giant megaphone. And what it does is to amplify the nastiness. Today you can... Uh, uh, sit and look at C-SPAN and you can see a member of Congress stand on the floor of the House of Representatives of the Senate uh, and use a nasty word. And you get immediate reaction to that, whereas uh, this wasn't the case, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago. So I think we're in a, a new context where I, what people but, say but and what they do is really magnified. I did her, right, I did her a little hold, hold, I did. hold on, hold on one second. Uh, let us grant that. That's what the media megaphone does. But weren't all the good government types, including probably everybody around here 20 and 30 years ago, saying, gee, people ought to know more about our elections and more about our politics. Then you had C-SPAN 1, C-SPAN 2, CNN, Headline News, PBS, and so on and so on, CNBC, and so on and so forth, uh, let alone a plethora of magazines. We know more about it, and some of what we know more about it is evil. Well, and it wasn't always, <laughs> it wasn't always so That's great either. I mean, Steve mentioned earlier, Adlai Stevenson, Dwight D. Eisenhower as the candidates for president in 1952. One of the major actors on the American scene in 1952 was a guy named Joe McCarthy, who was out there making false and slimy charges against people like General Marshall as having been influenced by the communist conspiracy and so forth. It was not a total time of political uplift, and, and McCarthy used, as Ron said, the media of those days in his way to amplify these often baseless charges for a while until he finally did himself in by going too far. Yeah, but I, so, I come down on Ron's side. Uh, uh, when you talk about the national political press corps today, you find it's far more cynical, far more sharp-edged uh, than any time in our lifetime. Now, obviously, if you want to go back, you can go back to the beginning of our country when our press were, was a partisan press. They were paid for by the politicians, no, and of no, course they were partisan and unpaid for. No, oh. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I, they're, they're I find paid for it by uh, by uh, by uh, ratings by ratings points. That's right on television, yeah. and a lot of other things. Uh, they uh, they become speech makers if they're uh, if they're shrill I'm enough on, uh, if they're well, shrill do, enough on the su Saturday and Sunday shows right. they can uh, well, we they can also, be very we well in the press but, but also now, talk now, about they say there's dirt and argument here whether there's dirt and clash and isn't it terrible oh, it's yeah. perfectly natural for republicans and democrats or from people with different points of view to disagree and i think we tend to over report the we say any, any disagreement is dirty. It's not dirty right. to disagree with somebody else. It's perfectly legitimate. Stephen has, I think has most hold reporters on. today, just yeah. let me just make that, most reporters today start with the premise uh, that the politician it does not wish to deliver on his promise. Right. No, and, and that's a very uh, serious charge. There is a been a transition in the career of journalism uh, from people who were expected to only report and then a few stars who had opinions to now a whole lot of people who are, uh, in fact, opinion leaders as journalists. And uh, we don't have a spotlight on, on that phenomenon, but I think that uh, we ought to hold journalists also accountable to that standard. Um, William Sapphire, this last week in a column called uh, Mrs. Clinton a congenital liar, and that become, became page one news, one columnist's opinion. It's kind of, uh, it is a lot of power. It is a lot of power. Well, he, he backed it up with some facts. I mean, it was, if somebody had just come out and made a charge based on no evidence, it wouldn't, of course, be news. But, but can you think about, of a journalist who, who used this kind of language uh, regularly uh, in the American media over the last uh, 30 or 40 years? Well, I can't I think, think of. I think there's a place for invective. I think if you go back to read what a lot of uh, Republican journalists said about Franklin D. Roosevelt, um, a lot of vitriol there. Colonel Mc the, the Chicago Tribune talking about the president having, uh, suggesting that the president conspired and knew about the Pearl Harbor invasion and allowed it to go forward and things. All right. Let, that let's was just, tough okay, stuff. Okay, you, you, uh, you touched on the greater world. Um, when fledgling democracies like uh, Russia or Nicaragua or the Philippines have elections, the people they want as election observers are from the United States. 
Uh, and they s the world seems to think that we are the fathers of, of uh, democracy. Uh, are we doing it better here than it is being done elsewhere? Election. I think part of that is we were not a colonial power. Uh, the uh, African nations with a free election are, are going to want to invite the British in, let's say. So I think there's, there's a, a little difference in, in who you invite in but, but uh, from you where know, you're coming. The, the Filipinos, where we were a colonial yeah. power, wanted us in. Mm -hmm. Well, and Latin, right. Latin Americans, where, where many people thought that we were a neocolonial power, often do. I, th I think a lot of credit goes in this country. National Democratic Institute, the Republican Institute, many people on the, both the political left and the political right in this country have played a very constructive role in places as far afield as Chile, Russia, in, in, in East, your, uh, in your no, former, South Korea and in, things, and they have done a heck of a good job in, and deserve more credit than they're getting. In your former incarnation as a pollster, many of those companies have gone around the world uh, preaching our peculiar kind of democracy. Well, in Sell some it, cases, selling it. some cases they've been selling their services and been consultants. In some cases they have just gone over as right. unpaid advisors to one side or another. But they actually also have started the polling industry. But but let me say something about South Africa because uh, I had a very rare experience uh, having been part of uh, Clinton's delegation to monitor the elections. And there I think it was the magic of uh, the stability of the American political process. And I think in many places, that is really what uh, attracts people to have us uh, in there. Uh, but the interesting thing to me is that the South Africans crafted uh, what they call a government of national unity, where everybody was at the table once they got through. And uh, Reverend Jackson and I were talking about that on the way back to this country. And we said, wait a minute. Uh, our system is one where you've got 49% uh, of the people can theoretically be out. It's a winner-take-all system. Uh, where if you get 51% of the vote, that's it. So now, uh, no, which I one is that, better? That's the point I wanted to come to. That's right. Okay. It, it, is our system of popular democracy uh, the best one around? I think it's too representative. And I think if, if you go back and, and look at the language that people were using to describe this system when it was put together, democracy, you won't see that very many times. As a matter of fact, there is a school of historians who think that uh, the people who framed our Constitution were afraid of democracy. And therefore, they put together a Republican form of government uh, really to give uh, the management of the political system to an elite. Uh, I think that it could stand far more inclusion, openness, uh, and participation. And, and, and so that pushes you toward the idea of non-winner-take-all toward a more proportional system the way you have in the European democracy. I think so, yes. I think, I think that our system, I would, I would guess I would take the opposite view. It seems to me that, that our system is pretty, the constitutional framework in the first place and, and the two parties that have developed and, and are now two of the three oldest political parties in the world, uh, what's, continuous the operation, what's the third one? Have, uh, the, the third one is the Conservative Party in Britain, if you date oh, okay. its beginning from the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846. Anyway, that's what the, I normally date it from. Yeah, uh, go but ahead. the, uh, right. but the, the, you know, the, the, the fact is we are a large and complex country, and we've got a system where nobody. Uh, it's very hard for any one faction, as Madison called them in the, in, the, in the Federalist Papers, to get total control. You have to accommodate people. Yes, one party can get control of the presidency in both branches of Congress like the Democratic Party did in 1992. But as we saw in 93 and 94, that's not automatically going to get all the Democratic programs enacted. And the voters were capable of throwing them out and putting in the Republicans, as they may be capable of throwing out the Republicans and putting right. in the Stephen, Democrats in 96. I'm, I'm, I'm on Michael's side. Um, I, I, I want as much glue holding this together as possible. I, I, I would be fearful of a system that became a multi-party system, a lot of separate caucuses uh, in, in the Congress, trying uh, but probably not succeeding uh, to make coalition. I think, I think the Founding Fathers have made an incredibly difficult and complex system to get anything done, as we're now obviously realizing uh, as it is. Uh, I, I, I think the proportional representation system makes it even more uh, complicated, and I would rather have the great tent theory and have uh, find room for everybody under one of these other tents. Let's just go to one more cosmic topic and get kind of a quick answer. Uh, let us stipulate, for the sake of discussion, that the United States is today the greatest, most influential country in the world. Question. 
Uh, is that because of or in spite of our election system? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I, would vote, I would vote because of, but I would add a little something to that. And it, I think that is, it is because of our electoral system and our constitution and our declaration of independence as supplemented by the ways in which our definition of rights uh, and who belongs in the system and who can run the system has become elastic so, and included so, the people so, who were not originally yeah. included. So uh, with all its flaws, it's Winston it, it Churchill contributing to our Winston greatness. Churchill once said democracy is the most horrible system that anybody's ever invented except for all the rest. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I no, think we ahead. would have come out about the same if we had worked out a if our founding fathers had other ideas about how to organize us. Uh, it, it's the nature of the richness of the country, it's the nature of the diversity of the people. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 we we would have survived I think probably quite well, maybe as well. Uh, under other other systems as well but now we have this one we're used to it you have to watch how you want to change it first of all you, you don't have the option of changing it in many ways so uh, you work around the margins I, 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 yeah. on a scale of one to ten uh, uh, terrible terrific where would you be Ron Walters well of course uh, I think now having seen what the South Africans have, and what exists in some European countries uh, I'd give it about a four. Oh, I'd have it right there down the middle. Uh, I, 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 can, I, I can't imagine other people, another system that I would prefer to be in right now. You cannot imagine? No, I so, absolutely so, cannot. So you would give so it? So that, on that scale, I'd have to give it a, a ten. If you talk about a scale of how much I like it to be better than it is, uh, then it comes down the middle. Uh, if I had to compare it in the long run of human history, I'd give us a 9 out of 10. I can think of a whole bunch of things that we ought to do to get to 10, and I'd like to see us do, but that's where I go. Okay. The, the answer is 7.83. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 let's do, just do one question to end this. Uh, if you could do one thing to reform our election system, what would it be? Michael Barone. Keep Ross Perot. No, I <laughs> no, next not, not persons. Uh, I'd try and get our campaign finance system working somewhat better. Maybe I'd tell each party that they'd have to come up with a plan that uh, they would come up with if they knew they were about to be swept from office, and, uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, which the Democrats should have done last time and didn't. I think probably the easiest thing we, we could do, a doable thing, would be to put the elections back under the framework and the roof of the political parties. Uh, our law now gives that pot of money for public financing to the candidates. I would like to try uh, to rebuild the parties that have uh, a continuing role, that aren't finished when the election is over. I cannot disagree with you more. Professor Walters, Ron uh, Walters. Yes, I was going to say that uh, I think sometimes we find the uh, efficacy of the electoral process really in society. And I think that's where we ought to look for, for some of our reforms. For example, I think that the, right now uh, the press has too much of a monopoly uh, over the process of political legitimacy. Uh, and I would, for example, give candidates far more access uh, to the forum, the public forum of debate and, uh, and educating the American people without the necessity of having to pay for everything. I think we can do that in this country. But, uh, free television time. Exactly, they do it in many other, Brazil sure. for example, uh, yeah. candidates have an allotted block of time in uh, which they could address the public. We can yeah. do that here. And in fact, the networks have done less of that in this cycle right. than they've done in, the in 92 and 88. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you, Ronald Walters, Michael Barone, and Stephen Hess, and thank you. Now, get your pencils and paper handy, announcing the Think Tank Contest for the Best Political Bumper Sticker. Part one, submit your entries for or against the likely Democratic nominee, President William J. Clinton. Entries must be received by February 1. The winning bumper stickers will be announced on Think Tank and awarded a prize. Later in part two, we will run a similar contest for the likely Republican presidential nominee. So please send your bumper stickers and any other comments and questions to New River Media, 11507 17th Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. We can also be reached and entries may be submitted by email to thinktv at aol.com or 
through the World Wide Web at www.thinktank.com. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.